you're all very welcome today to our talk with Amelia Tarode, our guest Q&A, a series of which we've been doing for a little while now with 42 courses. So first of all, I would like to turn to our guest, Amelia. You're very welcome, Amelia, joining us on our 42 courses guest speaker series. And maybe you'd like to tell everybody joining us today just a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you, Louise. Thank you, 42 Courses. Hello, everybody. It's such a pleasure to do these kinds of things. So thank you very much for inviting me along to do this. My name is Amelia. Um, I am a strategist, a brand strategist, I guess, um, sometimes an innovation consultant. Um, I kind of wear a number of different hats. I've been working in the industry for, sadly, a very long time. So I started in 1997 um, working for WPP. I was one of their early WPP fellowships. And I have had um, a career that I am so, I've loved, really genuinely loved it, um, that's taken me to the US, to the UK, around the world, to countries as far flung as China and Finland and Serbia and all over the place. Um, and I've worked for uh, big uh, companies big like WPP. Like WPP. Oh, sorry, I've got a little bit of feedback from WPP to agencies such as TBWA, Naked back in the day, Ogilvy Interactive, VCCP. And about six years ago, I left the world of agencies and I set up a brand and innovation consultancy called <laughs> Break. So I've been running my own business for the last six years and I think for me, the thing that I love, so I'm absolutely a kind of a strategist at heart. I've worked across kind of advertising, PR, CSR, digital. For me, the bit that really gets gets all my synapses kind of buzzing is about that connecting point between people and brands and thinking about spaces and places where they exist and how you can connect them um, using creativity. And I am constantly amazed that, um, well, not amazed, but I'm just, I'm delighted that I get paid for doing something that I really love doing. And I count myself very lucky to to, to do it. Well, it's just great, Amelia, that lovely introduction from yourself. Somebody's so happy in the role at work. I mean, and... I, you know, I have bad days. There are definitely <laughs> bad days. But, uh, you know, my goodness, if, if I think about the kinds of client problems that I work on, you know, you and I, Louise, were talking about books that we were reading that, you know, things like whether it's, you know, the Elon Musk biography or Shoe Dog, you know, we get paid to read about culture and to think and about, you know, how you decode and navigate culture and think about brands and businesses and organizations like you know what a privilege that is what a privilege and of course many of you joining us today on this talk are in either ad agencies marketing industry creativity industries but just let's go back to scratch Amelia and let's talk about what is the role of a strategist Oh, OK. I mean, I think the role of a strategist is is really one about kind of decoding. Um, I think really good strategists have fantastic um, cultural antennae. I think the you know, the best strategists I've ever worked with and almost in brackets, actually, some of the best strategists don't necessarily have the word strategy in their title, but really good strategic thinkers have great cultural antennae. They are really kind of eyes up and really interested. They notice things. And I think it's about um, sort of decoding and connecting um, signals in order to um, provide advice and counsel really. So I think it's a kind of decoding and helping to navigate is what I always think a great strategist is. And in a smaller agency, why should the CEO, why should the founder decide 
yeah, I, I need a strategist in my team. Um, because I think without somebody whose clear focus is on the strategy, I think you can get, um, it's very easy to get drawn off course, whether it's there are kind of um, administrative or business. I just think having somebody whose absolute center of gravity is thinking about the strategic direction of client business. Um, without that, I, I, my worry is that you lose a kind of fundamental anchor and that at coming out of it, the, the, work, the work suffers. And uh, as, as you said, I mean, your wealth of experience in such a large number of agencies, and then you decide, you know, the big decision to branch out and set up on your own. What was the, the, the thing that was going, what was going on at the time that made the difference for you to decide, yes, I, I want to go in my own direction? So, I mean, I think there were a number of things going on and, you know, some personal and, and some professional. So there, um, I, I mean, I had a real, um, I had a real moment of kind of personal crisis, actually. Um, so my, my lovely mum um, got a very late stage um, terminal cancer diagnosis. Um, so if people know anything about cancer, um, they stage it um, and there are four stages and stage four is when there's nothing you can do about it. Um, and my lovely mum, who was a kind of non-smoking, non-drinking, you know, super healthy, um, uh, had lung cancer um, and it was stage four and there was nothing they could do about it. And I think I had um, I had a real moment of thinking about you you do you have a real moment about what do I want to do I mean it's a real kind of esoteric moment um there's a an amazing quote uh Martin Luther King back in the 1960s was giving a sermon in the Riverside Cathedral in New York New York and King was talking about the Vietnam War and he uses this wonderful phrase where he talked about the fierce urgency of now and I think when somebody close to you has such a horrible diagnosis, um, there's a kind of fierce urgency of now. You really think about now. And I guess I'd always been tempted to think about trying to set something up in the way that I wanted, with a structure that I wanted. Uh, but there was never a right time. And then suddenly when that happened to my mum, it just made me think about there. there is never a right time. But the fierce urgency of now kind of compels you to do something and and I and I did and and actually I mean again it's been up and down there's been COVID in the middle there's been two young children needing homeschooling when their schools shut down but it has been such an adventure um and I'm so glad so glad well obviously not glad that but I'm I'm glad that actually out of a kind of tragedy with my mum um there was something I could take positive out of it and that was about kind of there is never a perfect time so you know give things a go I'm sorry to hear that that story but at the same time as you say something good came out of it in that you set up your company and fantastic referencing that Luther King quote as I think there's a lot of us regardless of our sort of life stages certainly through Covid as you say a lot of people stepped back and ask that question of themselves. So I think that's very pertinent really to the times we find ourselves in now. I mean, sort of drawing in, we hate to talk about COVID, it's become the second C word, but uh, drawing that in and drawing that in with strategy, uh, to what degree do you think even just general strategy in business is sort of more important than ever now as people are still now, I think, adapting to the fallout of this and the, the impact it's had on a lot of certainly on a lot of small businesses yeah I mean it, it's had impact on every kind of business actually I mean you know every everyone from school teachers to doctors to you know FMCG companies I mean the the effects are just you know wide-reaching and 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 so so deep as well I mean I think from a strategy perspective and for strategists, 
it's a really good time to be doing what we're doing because I don't, you know, I think it's never been as as needed. Um, I, you know, it, it definitely makes me think about kind of flexibles, you know, getting that balance between having a really clear and defined um, strategic objective, ambition, but also having the flexibility because, you know, so much, whether it's cost of living, whether suddenly there's a war in Europe, whether suddenly there's a war in the middle like this, you know, it feels like we've got, you know, rolling one after the other, after the other, you know, it's kind of punch after punch after punch that we're all having to, to adapt to. But I think without that kind of clear sense of strategy, what you just get is drift. So I think, you know, it, it's a very, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a great time to be a strategist because we, you know, everybody's, everybody's in need of, of, of clear sighted um, counsel. And uh, you talked about how the strategist uh, is somebody who sort of needs to have their finger on the sort of cultural zeitgeist, as it were. It, is, is it something that you think somebody's a certain type of person, sort of naturally curious and interesting, or can you actually train somebody to be a strategist? If you're not inherently sort of curious and wanting to learn about new things can, can you sort of engender this in yourself I mean so it's the kind of nature nurture question mm, isn't it mm. I mean all the best strategists I've worked with just have this kind of this this fizz mm. and this energy and this interest I think that probably anyone can kind of learn strategy I mean there are courses there are books there but but I think and and that and you can and I think that's fine. You know, there's kind of basic strategic principles. Actually, anybody can learn, but but I think those people that really excel and who clients adore and who people love working with just do have that curiosity. And you know, an old mentor of mine, Jeremy Bullmore from WPP, always used to say, "Well, he he said a great ad man." Um, but he meant, okay, you know, we we were talking about sort of planners, but, you know, he said that, you know, they're people who find something interesting in every section of the Sunday papers. <laughs> and, you know, and what he meant by that, you know, was, I don't really have any interest in cars. I'm not a petrol head. But, but, but actually, when a, somebody with a kind of strategic kind of mindset on, you know, we'll look at that and go, isn't that interesting, the design of that? Or, you know, you and I were talking earlier, Louise, about Tesla and e electric vehicles. And, you know, there's always something interesting around if you've got the kind of the mindset, the inquisitive mindset and that attitude of, of kind of asking why. There's all There's always something there. So I guess the short answer is, I think anyone can learn the fundamentals of strategy, but I think really extraordinary strategists um, have an insatiable appetite for understanding um, and, and really look harder than other people and take the time to look and take the time to think. That's a really good explanation. I'm just laughing to myself because my husband's always <clears throat> complaining about the amount of time it takes me to get through the Sunday paper because I've always got my tablet alongside me and I have to keep stopping and starting and looking something up and <laughs> as you say fi finding interest in things that you wouldn't on the face of it think you would you would be interested in. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm constantly, somebody said I weaponize my telephone. And I guess what they meant by it, so I'm constantly taking pictures of things. So um, it might be a shop front. It might be, sometimes I'll just take a picture of um, a quote that I've read in a newspaper, or it might be an ad I see on a bus, or, but I'm I'm just constantly snapping things because at some point I've kind of got a roller deck I suppose on my phone which is at some point I will use them like at some point there's a quote or 
there's a great collaboration that I haven't heard of, or there's a shop that I hadn't seen before. At some point, I'll use it. And it may be in a couple of years time, but just having it there is is so is so is so useful because there's always we're surrounded by interesting stuff but sometimes you walk past it and sometimes you don't remember it mm. so you've been giving some great examples from uh the areas you've been talking about for anybody who is with us who wasn't quite sort of au fait with what a, what a strategist does but maybe we can really sort of pin it down now would you mind maybe talking about a, a recent strategy campaign that you have worked on at form break so that people can really put it into course, sort of, of concrete course. context so um one one project that we worked on recently so in the center of london there is an organization called somerset house and it's amazing it's a beautiful old building um, on the banks of the river thames it used to be a palace it then became uh, i think it was part of the foreign office um, it's got a huge courtyard in the middle and it's this kind of incredible organization because it's got the Courtauld Art Gallery. Um, they have the largest collection of working artists who are there, who kind of pay a peppercorn rent. They have small businesses. They put on kind of um, like events. There are kind of dance nights. It's kind of amazing. It's this brilliant thing. And the... Um, the brief that we were given by the director of Somerset House was, um, what can John, the volunteer, so John is a real person and he's from Belfast and he's quite dour. He's quite, he's quite, it took a time for me to warm up to John, but, but John needed to have an answer to the question. So when an American tourist walks in on the Strand and says to John, gee, what is this place? John can't say, well, it's a cacophony of that. Like John wanted, John <laughs> needs an answer to what exactly this place is. Um, and it was a kind of fascinating project because there were so many stakeholders in it from artists to small business owners to art galleries. Uh, King's College is also connected. Um, and we, one of the things that the director at Somerset House had said is, I want everybody to feel part of this thing, but it doesn't, it feels like we're very siloed and we're a collection of kind of silos as opposed to one big house together. And we want a kind of organizational strategy for this company, for, for Somerset House, but for the brand of it, um, to, to build people, to kind of pull people together. And, and, and actually the strategy that we ended up coming up, so, so we gave them um, a positioning and the positioning was around being a, um, a working art centre because actually there's something very different about Somerset House versus any other kind of art gallery where there's always work in progress. So there are people at work, there are, you know, businesses at work, charities at work, there are artists, there are soundscapers, like there's just a buzz. And when you look up at Somerset House and you look at the windows, um, you'll see post-it notes are up and people are like, it's alive with people working on ideas and it's very different to an art gallery. So we, we gave them a positioning, which was London's Working Art Centre, which they loved because it kind of, it pulled in, everybody but I think the things that I was really proud of was that what we realized was that one of the reasons strategically or I guess emotionally why people within Somerset House didn't feel like they were all part of one experience was to do with lanyards which is really funny so the things that you wear around your neck and what we realized was that um, artists had a different colour, small business owners had a different colour, students had a different colour, and the colours denoted 
um, what discount you got in the canteen <laughs> and what discount you got in the shop. So actually what was happening was that all the people who kind of lived and worked at Somerset House were looking at each other going, oh, well, she gets 10%, she get, he gets 20%. And actually those coloured lanyards were kind of building in um, su kind of suspicion. So that was kind of interesting. And then the other thing that we found was that um, with Somerset House, it's quite a confusing space, the physical space. Um, it's called North Wing and South Wing. And unless you have a compass, it's quite difficult to know where you are and to navigate. And what we realised, it sounds really odd, but when you were getting in the lifts, the lift signage outside would say ground floor, you know, minus one, minus two. And, but when you got into the lifts, it would say um, lower ground. Base. It, the signage was all wrong. So that actually people were coming into Somerset House and the the lifts, like people, people were getting lost. So we gave them a sort of a strategic positioning, but then we also gave them a number of kind of really practical solutions to help with their with the challenge they were facing. So so actually, I'm kind of just as proud as the fact that we changed their lanyards and we changed their lift signage, because actually those were kind of practical examples of how strategy can translate into real world experience and then coming out of that then we could develop comms around advertising and around content but 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 you had to have that kind of strategic framework and you also for me I'm quite a practical strategist and I like seeing things come to life over and above here's a sick sheet or this is what an Instagram post would look like for me it's really important that strategy plays out in the everyday so it, it, it was an interest, a really interesting example and not not one that, you know, translated into a television ad or a TikTok, or, but it was a really interesting strategic challenge that allowed us to really think creatively and at different touch points as well. I think that's a super example and a very interesting one in as much as when people think generally about advertising agencies, you know, your, your first thought is always the advert it's the television the radio uh, out on the street and yet this is a, a very good example of a company that was struggling with an identity and brought in a strategist and I think there's lots of people who might not even realize that you can hire somebody to think through those issues that you're having within your within your company so I think that's a really super example uh, one of the messages you sent through to me when we were sort of messaging back and forth about the event uh, you called yourself a uh, strategic generalist maybe oh, is, yes. that the, is that the term you used and uh, I'd, I'd love to know then what what does that mean then that if someone calls them a generalist and then it, or can you be a strategic specialist or working well, no, just a can. particular I mean, area so what, what did so, you mean so by I that? always feel so I always feel a little bit um anxious that I'm too much of a generalist so I think everybody has their kind of imposter anxiety and um and maybe it's because I started my career as a marketing generalist so the way that um the wpp fellowship used to work it was it was a three-year-long grad program and you did three years three different disciplines and if you wanted to three different countries so it was just amazing so right at the beginning i'd spent um a year in advertising then i did a year in media and then i did a year in digital in digital um here and in the us so right from the beginning, I've always thought quite broadly, and I've never really thought about myself as a kind of as an ad person or as a digital person. I've kind of just thought about myself as a, as a strategist who really likes brands and who really likes people and loves technology and kind of how do you connect them? Um, and, you know, there is all the thing about kind of T-shaped T planners and you, you've got to have a really good overview but you've got to have a center of gravity somewhere um and sometimes i worry um that my center of gravity 
isn't deep enough and what is that center of gravity and actually i think my center of gravity is probably is strategy but you know there are you know plenty of people who can write a better social strategy than i can or who can write a better crm strategy than i can but i i think i'm pretty good at putting the pieces together um but I think you can, you know, your question of can you have strategic specialists? Absolutely. And my goodness, you know, when you find them and you really gel with them, I mean, that's where the kind of magic happens. Because I think, you know, it was, it was funny. So I was, I was mentor, I do sort of mentoring. And I was having coffee with a young woman who is um, a strategist in the world of out of home. And she was just brilliant. Yes, I had a coffee with her yesterday morning. And she knew so much about out of, out of home, so much more than I would ever do. But actually, she didn't really understand about brands. And her, her kind of aperture was, was quite limited. So, you know, what she needed was the ability to kind of partner in with somebody who could help open her aperture. But her, what she loved was out of home. Um, but I'm constantly anxious that my bit, my T bit isn't isn't deep enough. You, you mentioned Jeremy Bulmore earlier, who you obviously had the the privilege to work with. Who have been your influences? I mean, I think Jeremy is just extraordinary, and I miss him every day. He um, passed away earlier this year. He was in his nineties but still working at WPP. Um, and, you know, everybody should read everything that he's ever written um, because he's just the most extraordinary, clear thinker. Um, and Jeremy's work is, is just fantastic. Um, I was also very lucky to work with another planner in the US called John Steele, who has written a number of books, um, Perfect Pitch, uh, Truth, Lies and Advertising, and John Steele is another person who is just an extraordinary thinker and, again, is worth reading, you know, everything he's written. He really helped me think about storytelling in pitches. Well, it's just storytelling generally and how you persuade. I mean, he's brilliant. He, you know, he could have been, he could have been a lawyer. He, he would have won every case he ever fought. Um, and then... A long time ago, um, again, another planner, Russell Davies, who was at Wyden and Kennedy for a long time at Nike, um, government digital service. Russell, who's another extraordinary brain, was hugely influential on me, kind of, I suppose, back at the beginning of this century. So kind of early noughties when he was very generous with with planners actually when there was a kind of this wonderful kind of planner sphere um and he would put together meetups on a friday i think at, at the breakfast club in soho and you know strategists would come together and he was really um generous with his time and got people blogging and writing and thinking and sharing and he he had this wonderful conference called interesting where people would come and bring stuff that they found was, that was interesting. But I guess it goes back to what we were talking about, which is, you know, really great strategists do find interesting things. It, and they find interesting things where other people don't think they're interesting, but planners do. Um, so, you know, uh, you know, all of those have had a real impact. But I just, I you know, I think... The strategy community is is a nice community on the whole and you know it's it's a supportive i mean i've 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 you know i've found it to be an intelligent and supportive community that kind of helps bring people up as opposed to knock people down that's lovely we're all very nice aren't we i mean yeah uh, good <laughs> we all need more nice and um you mentioned there about reading uh jeremy bulmer's work um i obviously you're a, a a big reader i'm an avid reader myself 
um, I often hesitate to actually start these questions because you could go prattling on all day about it. But what what are you reading at the moment, Amelia? Or are there other books you would recommend to anyone who's joined? Yeah, I mean, I just think we've all, you know, I mean, I say this to my children and then they don't never bloody read anything. But, you know, we, we've got to, be, you know, that that's how you learn, you know. So um, I've just finished the uh, Walter I, I, I Isaacson um, on Elon Musk, which I just found absolutely fascinating. I literally, I I couldn't put it down. And the, I mean, so that, that I just think is amazing. I've always got kind of multiple books on the go. I'm really, really interesting book at the moment called um, Teenage, um, which is by, um, by an ex-journalist called John Savage. And it's about the creation of sort of teenage and adolescence as a point in time. And he has a very interesting premise because most of the time people think that sort of teenagers started with the Beatles. Mm. And actually what John does in his book is he looks much further back into kind of the 1870s, sorry, yes, the 1870s, 1890s, um, and looks much earlier at the, because it, you know, it used to be you were a child and then you were an adult. And the beginnings of, of sort of adolescence as a kind of, as a mindset and as a kind of demographic, I've just found, yeah, abs 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 absolutely fascinating. Sounds really interesting. I haven't heard of that. I know that uh, Chris, our founder, will be nodding there when you mention the uh, Walter Isaacson Oh, uh, I just, Elon Musk biography, oh, which is uh, he's yeah. a man, love him or hate him, that obviously he's part of all our lives and very but, much know, part is, of I current mean, what, culture. What's so astonishing is Musk runs six companies, six companies, you know, jobs at his peak, right, you know, ran Pixar and Apple, but, you know, he, Tesla, Neuralink, um, you know, um, I mean, he's, it's the boring company. Like, it's it's unbelievable. It is unbelievable. Twitter, X, whatever, you know, whether it's on fire or not. But the, the impact, oh, my God. I mean, it's just, he's, an, what a force of nature. And just trying to kind of understand. Anyway, I just, I, 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 I audibled it, actually. I, I kind of, with, with a lot of those kind of bigger books, I tend to uh, I, lots of them. I I I have to listen to because I'm it just it's just easier for me. And if if I'm traveling around, but I couldn't I couldn't stop look I couldn't stop couldn't stop listening to it. Oh, well, that's a, a marvelous advertisement for it. And uh, we chatted earlier that I'd also read the book Power Play, which is about the birth of tesla and again i said to amelia absolutely fascinating reading would never believe the company could have ever built one car if you understood no, I'm, I'm exactly super what was going got, on in the factory oh i've got that i've got I'll, I'll 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 download that the other one i've just downloaded actually um this morning is one called blood and oil um which is all about the sort of middle east and and um and saudi politics um and I think for me, I don't know enough about that area. So I think, you know, that was something that I, I keep meeting people who, young people in the industry, who are all moving to the Middle East because that's where they say the money is mm -hmm. and that's where they say the opportunities is and that's where the kind of excitement is. And, you know, and then they all talk about... Um, ethics and they're kind of making some ethical decisions and choices um but certainly the sense i get from a lot of people that i'm talking to is you know they're not people aren't rushing to go and work in the states like you know i did 20 years ago the only place i wanted to work was the states there is an anxiety about europe um but people are you know are really thinking about those middle eastern countries and so you know it's for me that I, Again, you know, I need to make sure that I understand more about that context because I, I don't enough. That's very interesting. Very interesting observations. Not something I can say I 
really thought about, but I had heard of the book you mentioned, and there were several others I think recommended. This weekend, last weekend, uh, was the big FT when they have oh, their yes, books yes, the book. Oh, yes, 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 I love that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and what's great about those books is ones that really, from the description, you would just think, oh, I'd never be interested in that. But I suppose that's the power of a, a good writer or a good journalist is that they can make something that on the face of it yes. probably sounds quite boring <laughs> yeah no absolutely can, I mean I always show think, you the you interest know, in it absolutely I mean a, a great documentary maker makes anything interesting I think I remember like years ago watching a brilliant documentary and I think it was about something like I don't know like the plumbing system in ancient Rome or, <laughs> but, you know but, but that's what a great that that that's what a you know they they find something fascinating and you go god i never thought that would be interesting but i can't stop, can't stop moving. you're absolutely right yeah i'm not ashamed to say i watched one last week on pigeon racing did you <laughs> pigeon racers in in america so there we go it was actually really interesting <laughs> I, I I I would like to watch something. Or I would like. I know nothing yet. Pitch, is it pigeon fanciers or something? Pigeon fanciers. Wow, okay. Anyway, sorry, let's not let's not get diverted by pigeons. Talking about pigeons. Um, so obviously, I do want to bring in everybody who's joined us today. It's great to see so many people joining us. Everything Amelia's been telling us about so interesting, and I can see a question. Uh, from quite towards the start of the chat from uh, Veal. Are you still with us, Veal? You had a very interesting uh, question. Hello, Veal. I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself if you don't mind. Yeah, and I'd you. love you to put your question to Amelia. You're very welcome, Veal. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm actually working in a small agency where um, they don't have real strategy and it kind of feels that they don't value it enough or they don't see the importance of it so much. Um, but I'm thinking of, about changing to strategy and like really filling that void, void uh, maybe in this agency, but if not, I'm, I'm maybe moving elsewhere. Um, but I do want to make the change to strategy. I've been a creative for the past 20 years. Like, how do I do this? Oh, um... <laughs> <laughs> or what's a um, good start well no i mean so listen uh some of the most strategic people i've ever worked have have had the you know i said right at the beginning some of the most strategic people have never had the word strategy in their title uh jeremy bullmore my mentor was was a creative all his life but the most strategic person i've ever had the pleasure of working with um so i i'm sure that already really good creatives think highly strategically because they think about their audience they think about the strategy i mean you're you're probably doing it already um i mean i'm a big fan of the apg i don't know if you know that organization uh the apg i mean originally it stood for the account planning group um it's set up in the uk um but their courses are often online and are brilliant um and that you meet a kind of you create a cohort um you meet a kind of gang of people um and you're kind of trained together i think the apg are great i uh, 42 courses again would have uh some brilliant resources <laughs> um but the ap uh, the apg um do specific courses for people transitioning out of um specific disciplines into strategy and that's all they do it it's it's planning and strategy so I, i'd probably be tempted to to start with the apg uh, yeah that's definitely a good suggestion i've also already done some of the behavioral science courses brilliant like 42 courses which yeah. i really like um but like if someone has suggestions for for books or resources i'm i'm really uh, willing to hear i'm also thinking of maybe I don't know, like I've already got 20 years of experience as a creative, like to go somewhere where I can maybe do like partly strategy and part creative. Well, listen, ping me afterwards. So um, <laughs> I'd be very happy to help point you in the right direction. All right. Thanks thank you very, very much. Thanks very much, Phil. That's a great question. And thank you so much for joining us. Um, so I can see a question 
uh, from, sorry, don't, don't just apologize. I just uh, messed up Veal. I think I might have thrown her out of the meeting. Uh, I can see a message in there from, uh, sorry, let's have a look at chat. Um, Well, I've just lost my question. Oh, no, it was Luke. There we go. <laughs> back on board. I'm back on board. Uh, Luke was actually referring to the example you were giving, Amelia, of your, your strategy example in Somerset House and just had a particular question about it. Would you like to join us, Luke, and put your question to Amelia? Or will I just read that out? I can see you're still with us. No response was the stern reply. So what Luke was asking there, Amelia, was he was very interested. Oh, hello. Oh, hi there, Luke. You're hi. very hi, welcome. Luke. Do you have any was... bandwidth to put on your camera, Luke? I have bandwidth. I don't know if I understand how to use oh, Zoom not on to a mobile worry at all. to we'll turn on there. We'll camera. leave you there in the dark and put your question to Amelia. Uh, very no, welcome. it involves change, changing settings, which is beyond no me. No problem. Um, your question. <laughs> Yeah, so I thought the you know the Somerset House example was great, and I got the brief there from the client, which was really nice that they put that into the hands of a specific person, I guess. Uh, and I got the output that you designed and you created. I was interested in what went on between the two. You know, how do you approach that problem? What are the processes? Is it research and then development and then iteration? Lovely. You know, I'd love yeah. a little bit of Thanks, detail. Thanks, Luke. On that. Very practic practical question. That's no, lovely. Luke, that's a that's a super help. That's a great question. So um, one of the things that we always do when we are on strategy projects, so we um, go and kind of live with the client. So, oh, hello, I can see. Hello. <laughs> I like your wallpaper as well. <laughs> hello, Luke. Um, You're very welcome. So when when I started the company, um, it was back in 2017. And one of the things that we kind of deliberately did was we didn't have a headquarters because what we always said with every client project was we put into the contract that they would give us space um, for the duration of the project. So we would go and live in the organization and work out of it because we always found that that gave you much better insights into the challenge that you were trying to face. So we went and lived and worked out of Somerset House. So I guess it was between for about four or six weeks, but we did a number of um these things of which we call strat hacks, which are kind of strategy hackathons, whereby they're kind of sort of building workshops whereby you are creating a strategic prototype together. So you're pulling in um, all the different sort of stakeholders, all the different, um, well, I guess, yeah, stakeholders from, from the sort of different, from across... Somerset House and what we what we would do was a series of these strat hacks where we were building a proposition and really trying to get under the skin of what made um, Somerset House different as a place to visit as a place to work as a place to um, to eat as a place to socialize in so we we went through quite a um, structured approach which was exactly that loop where we created prototypes we we put it we put it back into teams we tweaked we iterated but it was totally collaborative with with the client so one of the things that I've always hated is the kind of the client gives you the brief and you go away for six weeks and then you kind of you know the velvet curtains opens and they're like well that wasn't what I expected or, you know, sometimes it works, but lots of times it doesn't. And then you've just spent weeks and you've all killed yourself and it hasn't worked. So I, I, I always think that strategy is a kind of team sport. And if it's a team sport, we've got to become much better at allowing clients into the process with us. So it was always a very flat and a very iterative process because then when you have the final presentation, there really isn't much surprise because you've kind of built it together. Great, thank you. Thanks so much, Luke. That was a great question, a very practical question. So I think we have time for one more question. Um, <clears throat> Sarah, you've just put a question in our comment box. I'd love it if you would join us to talk to Amelia. 
Thank you so much. Hi, Amelia. Great to meet you. And thank you so much for everything that you shared um, with us this morning. I've just been manically making notes in the background, <laughs> all loads of really real amazing gems and pearls of wisdom. Thank you. Um, I would love to ask you, do you always start with, so any strategic project that you're working on, do you always start with vis vision, mission, values and purpose? The reason that I ask that is that I just find it almost impossible to work with a client, whatever their challenge might be. It might just be some really kind of random non-purpose connected challenge. Whatever their challenge is, I find it really, really hard to, to sort of get get started or get or get any direction. And if we don't actually start with establishing those things first. Also, I just I love establishing those things. <laughs> the client doesn't doesn't so, have so, knowledge of, of those things. So, so do I. I guess one of the things though that I work like that sometimes those kind of even those words like kind of vision and mission and this and that. Like I think sometimes as an industry we can trip up over our own feet, and 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 sometimes you can have kind of hair splitting semantics of is it a vision or is it a mission or and then suddenly you get into these kind of useless conversations of it's like yeah. so um what i tend to do is I, I i look at three things um when i start a project and i think about um beliefs ambition and truths so i um I often, I so I often start with kind of beliefs. So what are the beliefs of the organisation? So I, so so I, often I start with kind of I, I I tend to sort of have on a post it somewhere like kind of build from beliefs. So I start with kind of what are the beliefs, and actually that beliefs are always much easier for clients to articulate rather than a vision or a mission, which sometimes can be quite highfalutin and it doesn't really meet. Whereas actually. What do you believe as an organization? What do you believe? What do you believe about your products? What do you believe about your culture? So try kind of mapping some beliefs are a really um, good way to start. I also mm -hmm. really like thinking about truths. So um, what are some of the truths about your, again, about the product, about your audience, about, I don't know, your budget? You know, we don't have any, like that would be a truth. Like, you know, we've only got, you know, a hundred thousand, but, 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 but I, so I, I, I think I get, I get people talking about beliefs. I get people thinking about the truths. And then I think I get people to think about ambition. So for me, and this is entirely personal, sometimes vision and mission can feel a bit too out there. Whereas an ambition, a five-year ambition, an ambition to me mm -hmm feels a bit more practical so so i i always talk about really strong strategies kind of sitting at the intersection of beliefs truth and ambition and if you can think mm. about belief truth and ambition into a solution again for me that becomes eminently practical as opposed to here's a vision you know because the vision is always we have a vision of ending that like it it's often too far away and yeah yeah it's often not not really touchable is it right. it just feels far too it, you can't get your hands on it whereas belief truth mm. and ambitions to me people I can understand it and if I can understand it then I can help yeah. clients understand it I love that thank you thanks thank, Amelia. That's thank really helpful. you so much Sarah that was a great question so I think we're coming very much to the end of today's session and it's really been quite a master class Amelia and uh, as Sarah was saying I'm sure there's plenty of people here today who've been scribbling away furiously there's been lots of very good suggestions in the chat box and uh, Chris our CEO has shared lots of very practical information in the chat box with links so I hope you've all taken notes from that as well um, it's really been an honour to speak to you Amelia uh, we could go on all day I'm sure but We've come to the end of this session. So thank you so much for joining us today. Really been sharing some super information and uh, you've been very welcome. And thank you to everybody who has joined us 
today, taken your time out of your busy day to hear the uh, wealth of uh, wealth of wisdom. <laughs> From, I, uh, very, you're very kind very kind um and I was just going to say I mean in the olden days when I was on Twitter I would have said connect with me on Twitter and I'm sadly not on Twitter anymore because it's kind of burning um but um you know connect on LinkedIn I'm always happy to chat always happy to have um you know a virtual cup of tea um and a conversation so you know LinkedIn or, or sort of Instagram as long as you can put up with some pictures of my children playing football <laughs> <laughs> generous as ever thank you so much thanks everyone for joining us do join us again and um, just a little insight into next month's event in about three weeks time we will be speaking with Rory Sutherland who I know most oh, people here are a great Rory. fan of so I do hope you'll look out for our share of the link to the next event but until that next time thanks everyone for joining us and hope to see you again soon bye now